We decided to title our series in Deuteronomy a people at the boundary because we recognized an opportunity. Uh, There's a very unique opportunity to draw lessons from the experience of these nomadic Hebrew people who are standing, as you know, I talked about this over the last few weeks, there they are, they're standing poised just on the eastern side of the Jordan River, they're looking west into the promised land, and they're waiting for where God is going to lead them next, and we recognize there's a huge opportunity here to draw lessons for that, from that for our day, 2023. Our situation right here has some really significant things in common with their situation back then, their moment. Picture them there, poised, probably a little bit nervous, wondering, where's God leading us next? recognizing whatever it is, something impossible lies ahead of us. That's what it means to be a people at the boundary. Today, even 2023, people at the boundary, a people at the boundary are about to embark on something impossible. God has a task for our church that cannot be accomplished through human effort alone, just like the people of Israel And a people at the boundary won't follow just anyone into an an impossible mission. They would need a vision. They would need to be inspired with a vision of the kind of God that has led them there. They would need an inspiring vision of who God truly is and why they can trust him completely. And that's what Moses gives them that day. Standing on the boundary, Moses gives them passion. He gives them inspiration. I've heard it said that the book of Deuteronomy is a lot like a halftime speech when the team is down 21 to zero and they come, into the, they come into the locker room and the coach comes in and fires people up. You can do this, right? And Moses, there he is. He's like, okay, yeah, the starters, they're out of the game. They, uh, they failed. And so I'm putting in the B squad, but you can do this. It's like a pep talk. I went online last night and I typed in, what are the top 10 halftime speeches of all time? Because that's what you do on a Saturday night before you preach. And all these came up and I watched them and I got so fired up to preach today. You know what's amazing? One of the ones that shows up over and over is Tim Tebow walking into the the Florida Gators are down like 17 to zero, it's halftime. And and, and it's regarded as one of the greatest halftime speeches of all time. And all he does for 30 seconds is he just screams, just screams and he doesn't say anything coherent. And then the guys are like, yes, and they go out and they win the national championship, right? Luckily, Moses is a lot more coherent. (laughs) Moses says, I'm gonna give you a vision. What do they need? They need to be told the story of something God had just done. A story of something they learned about God as he led them through the wilderness for 38 years. Because they learned some things about God's character. What happens is Moses tells the story now of the people of Israel being led north up towards that eastern side, the plains of Moab, and they're led past five different nations, five different people groups. I'm gonna put up a slide so you can kind of see. You're gonna encounter all these names, and I just want you to get familiar because it's a very complex passage. What happens is over the course of that, we're gonna preach all of that today. Chapter two in verse one, all the way to 311. The people of Israel are led past five different nations, Edom, which are the descendants of Esau, Moab, who are the descendants of Lot, Ammon, who are the descendants of Lot, and then two kings. And along the way, God says, for, he says, okay, do not engage with Edom. Do not engage with Moab. Stay away. I don't even want you to step foot in their territory. He says, do not engage with Ammon. But when they get to the two kings, Sihon and Og, God says, engage in battle. I'm actually gonna give you their land. And that's the story that we're gonna look at today. But here's the thing, you can take that slide down. Thank you, Leslie. The story is just the details, but what's happening beneath the story is Moses is gonna say, remember what you learned about God when he led you in the wilderness. And here's what Moses says. You learned three lessons about God's character. God taught you about his scandalous mercy, number one, 
Then he taught you about his absolute sovereignty, number two. And then he taught you about his perfect justice. Mercy, sovereignty, justice. I just added some words to make it more interesting. So I said, it's scandalous mercy. You know why I said that? Because when you hear mercy, you're like, oh, I know about God's mercy, but actually none of us knows about God's mercy. Because if we actually got God's mercy, we would add the word scandalous to it, right? Because his mercy is so out of control that it could, God could be accused of being reckless. It's a scandalous mercy. And it's not just sovereignty, it's absolute mercy sovereignty over every tribe, every nation. And God's not just just, he's perfectly just, which you're going to need because in the story we're going to read, it's going to get a little bit gnarly. And some of you are going to wonder, wait a minute, is God just? So I'm going to talk about that. Here's the thing. This passage is very long. It's very complex. There's a bit of controversy. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to read fast. I'm going to skip over large portions of verses that I'm not going to explain adequately. Amen. So put on your seatbelts. You're like, this sounds fun. It's going to be very fun. Okay. Look at your Bible with me. Number one, here's what you need to know. Lesson number one, God's mercy is scandalous. It's scandalous. And the reason I say it's scandalous is because the mercy that Moses is about to describe is poured out on people after they have just rebelled against God, refused to follow him, and God sends them into the wilderness to be disciplined. And it's only after they go into the wilderness that he does some things that are unbelievably merciful. These people do not deserve mercy, which is why it's scandalous. Verse 1. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. And for many days, we traveled around Mount Seir. So this goes back to last Sunday. The people had come to the southern end of the promised land. God said, go in, take the land. And they said, we don't really want to do that. And they rebelled. And God said, all right, then turn around and go back towards the Red Sea. And this is now the people in the wilderness. They're being disciplined. They've they've turned and now they've headed south. And they wander in the wilderness for 38 years until the first generation dies. But the astounding thing about it is even in the wilderness, God is with them pouring out mercy. I want to talk to you for just a minute about the wilderness. See, in the Bible, the wilderness shows up again and again. And there's kind of a theology of wilderness. And Here's what, it, here's what it is. In the Bible, the wilderness is the place that you go to learn how to actually trust God. That happens in the wilderness in the Bible. Paul goes into the wilderness. Jesus, even, Jesus himself goes into the wilderness. The people of Israel go into the wilderness. And every time people are sent into the wilderness, the goal is to learn how to trust God. Why? Because the wilderness is dangerous. The wilderness is barren. The wilderness makes people vulnerable. You die out in the wilderness. You starve in the wilderness. You get eaten by wild animals in the wilderness. It makes you very vulnerable. This is hard for us to relate to as Oregonians because in Oregon, we go into the wilderness to forage for chanterelles and walk behind waterfalls and make amazing Instagram reels, right? But that's not the Bible. See, in the Bible, the wilderness is a place where you're never going to survive if you don't have God there with you. And so, folks, this is powerful because what happens in this story is we realize, yes, God sent them into the wilderness to be disciplined, but this is the astounding thing. He went with them into their wilderness and he continued to lead them and he poured out his mercy. And I just have to ask you really quick, what are the chances in this room that a lot of you are in a wilderness season right now, right? Or you've been in one recently or you sense that one is coming. And the amazing thing about the wilderness is one of the things you might discover is that God is unbelievably merciful. Even God will never waste a wilderness. Even if you're being disciplined for something that you've done to rebel against God, God will use that. Look at verse two. We realize God's still leading them. Then the Lord said to me, so God is speaking. He's leading. 
He says, you've been traveling around this mountain country long enough. It's time to go. Turn north. Remember that from two Sundays ago? This is God's way of saying, hey, my purpose for this season, it's finished and it's time to go. In other words, a wilderness season will not last forever. Be encouraged. Are you in a wilderness? That's not going to last forever. God will use it for a time and then he'll say, okay, now it's time to go. Here's the problem. For a lot of us, God says, I'm done with that. But for some reason we stay in the wilderness. Why do we do that? God's like, my, my, my purpose for this is over, but we're like, no, I'm gonna stay a little longer and really punish myself, right? Or God will say, hey, friend, I died for that sin. Why are you still punishing yourself for it? God's saying, my purpose for that is through. Start moving, start going. Amazing. Keep reading. I left off at verse three. God says next, uh, turn northward, command the people. You're about to pass through the country of your brothers, the people of Esau. So this is the first nation, Edom. These are the people of Esau. So this is Jacob's brother from Genesis. And because of that, God calls them your brothers. He says, they live in Seir and they will be afraid of you. Be very careful. Do not contend with them. Remember this first people group, God says, don't engage for I will not give you any of their land, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on because I've given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink for the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness Will you look at that phrase? He knows. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. God's there. You're not alone. Oh, we have a spiritual enemy who wants to tell you you're alone. And if you're hearing right now, I'm alone, that's not coming from Jesus. That's coming from our spiritual enemy. God knows you're, you're, you're going in the wilderness. And then look what he says next. Not only does God know, he's blessed you. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You lack nothing. Mercy, scandalous mercy. How did they get money to buy water and food? Wandering through the wilderness. They got got resources because God blessed them. How did they multiply even in the wilderness where people die and starve? They were blessed. They became affluent. They multiplied. Why? Because God was pouring out scandalous mercy, even in the wilderness. And I want, and folks, I want to just press this because I know some of you are there. So basically, here's what I want you to know. About 13 years ago, I, the Lord led me into a season of wilderness. It lasted about a year. It was very painful. God had a lot of work to do. He was pointing out some stuff in my life. There was some discipline happening. It was a very fragile time in my life. And the thing about it is, now I look back on that time and that phrase, God knows you're going through the wilderness. I I can say that with absolute confidence. I learned things about God's grace in that one year that would have taken me dozens of years in another season of my life to learn right? Do you know that? You go through something really hard and it's terrible in the moment, but then you look back later and realize, look what I learned about the character of God and the mercy of God. Now, would I go back and do it again? (laughs) No, (laughs) right? Am I saying, hey, sin has benefits? No. You can learn about God's grace by not sinning. But sometimes even when we fail, God meets us with mercy That's just the kind of God we serve. Imagine being the people of Israel standing at the border and Moses reminding them of this. They would have said, yes, we can do this. Thank you, Tim Tebow. Let's go, right? It was very encouraging. Moses says, that's the God we serve. But not only that, not only is God scandalous in his mercy, but look at this. God's sovereignty is absolute. There's no limit. Why do I say absolute sovereignty? Here's what I mean by that. 
Whatever your view of God's sovereignty is, try to imagine, you know, God's in control, okay? Whatever your view of that is, the Bible's is probably higher. It's probably higher. The Bible has an extremely high view of the sovereignty of God. And what happens is Moses now for the next about 31 verses, he's just going to tell a story that shows over and over and over God's sovereignty. I'm going to read over it pretty quick. There's a lot of names. I'm going to stop at a couple points and explain some stuff, but you're just going to have to bear with me. Remember, here's the point. God's in control. God's working. He's moving in the, in the nations and people groups that are migrating and even warring behind the scenes. God's absolutely sovereign. So let me read it now, verse eight. So we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau who live in Seir, away from the Arabah road from the Elath and Ezion Geber. And we turned and we went to the direction of the wilderness of Moab, people group number two, Moab. These are the descendants of Lot. And the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle for I will not give you any of their land for a possession. Why? Because I've given it, I've given R to the people of Lot for a possession. This is interesting. So God gives Israel a piece of land for their possession, but also God's working in other people groups. How fascinating. He's giving the people of Moab a a piece of their own land for their, their possession. God's sovereign behind the scenes. It's very interesting. The Emmon formerly lived there, a people great and many, as tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also counted as Rephaim. Now I have to explain this word. The word Rephaim, when you, anytime you see that word and you're gonna see it three or four more times in this story, think Goliath. That is the word, that's the word, the, the Hebrew word that the people of Israel used to describe these ancient wicked giants, these warriors that went all the way back, if you know Genesis 6, to the Nephilim. And the, and the Hebrew people started to call them Rephaim. And they were warriors, they, the, the, the Hebrew people were afraid of them. And they live in this land that the people of Israel have been told to, to occupy. But here's what he says. The Moabites call them Emin. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them. So there's all kinds of people groups dispossessing other people groups as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. Now rise up, go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered and from the time our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire first generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn. Remember last Sunday I told you their, their discipline for being stubborn and refusing to obey, God said, okay, go into the wilderness and that first generation, you're gonna die in the wilderness and it will be the second generation that enters the promised land. God's now fulfilling that promise. For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, today you're to cross the border of Moab at Ar. And when you approach approach the territory of the people of Ammon, this is now the third people group, do not contend with, with them. I'm not giving you any of their land of the people of Ammon as a possession. Why? Because I've given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. I'm gonna stop. So much going on. Here's the point. Pull back the lens. Notice how often it says, I've given that land to them for a possession. Don't contend with them. Oh, those people, I've given that land to them as a possession. Don't contend with them. And don't contend with them either. I have a land for you, it's further north. And the point is, we're seeing a picture of the sovereignty of God. Now I need you to think with me about this. 
What Moses is saying is all of these migrations and battles and wicked things that happen in a broken, fallen world and nations conquering other nations and it can be awful and violent and brutal and wicked somehow in the unbelievable wisdom of God, God is somehow sovereign over that. And even in the midst of wickedness, he's gonna bring about his redemptive purposes. Nothing's gonna stop God from accomplishing his purpose of redemption. Even war, even nations conquering other nations. We struggle with this, don't we? Some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, what are you saying? Are you saying, pastor, that God is in control of all this violence in our world and wickedness? That's what sovereign means. God's in control. And people go, I'm not sure. That's really disturbing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about it for just a minute, okay? Because I wanna help you. The first thing you always need to remember is if you're disturbed by the idea of God being in control, recognize that the opposite of that is more disturbing. If you think it's disturbing having a God who's in control, I promise you, it's more disturbing to have a God who's out of control. No one wants that. A powerful God who's not in control of what's happening. Not only that, anytime the Bible talks about God's sovereignty, it's not describing God micromanaging all of the little details, every minute detail. What it's describing is a God who even in a world where humans are against him and doing things against his purposes, he is still going to bring about ultimate blessing to the nations. Redemption. Nothing's gonna stop God. The nations can rage. God's gonna bring about his redemptive purposes. Adam and Eve are gonna eat from the fruit that God said don't do it. What's God gonna do? He's gonna bring about his redemptive purposes. Joseph's brothers are gonna try to murder him and then send him into slavery into Egypt. That's terrible. What does God do? God uses that to bring about his redemptive purposes. Pharaoh says, I'm not letting your people go, Yahweh. What does God do? He brings about his redemptive purposes. Wicked human beings torture the son of God and they nail him to a cross. And what does God do with that? Oh, he brings about his redemptive purposes. And folks, you need to hear this because I know for a fact, some of you, you're going through hell right now. And you're wondering, what, how, God, how can you be, God, how can you be good? How can you be sovereign? Did you know, even in your life, when cancer hits, when, 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 when people sin against you, when you are, when you're wronged, when things don't go your way, did you know there's a God who's sovereign and he can bring about his redemptive purposes, even in all of that? Be encouraged. Amen? Amen? The early church, what did they do? They, 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 they fed Christians to the lions. Anytime your life is hard, just go, I could have been fed to the lions, okay? So there's this all this perspective, right? You know what happened? They fed Christians to the lions, and you know what happened? God brought about redemptive purposes. Christianity spread like wildfire through that. Isn't that incredible? I've been reading all these books about the early church and it's just so fascinating that how that works. Christians are thrown to the lions and yet somehow, even in that, they had no power, they had no prestige, they weren't popular, no one liked them, they're getting murdered and somehow God uses that to cause the gospel to spread throughout the ancient world. Even in their defeat, they're conveying the truth of the gospel. How does that work? You could throw a Christian to the lions and it actually became a powerful witness to the reality of the grace of Christ. (laughs) Because people saw Christianity is so powerful that it gives these Christians the strength to suffer joyfully 
So people were forced to recognize that Christianity actually had the answer to something that the entire world was desperately afraid of. Losing. Suffering. Our world will do anything to not lose and not suffer. But somehow Christianity gives individual Christians the ability to lose and to suffer and to do it with unbelief, a grace that's so profound that people see it and go, there's got to be something to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This week I... Um, I heard the story of a really famous missionary who he'd been a missionary for many years. He was very experienced, very eloquent. And he, and he went to reach a, a tribe, a people group that were totally unreached. And he spent three decades of his life, the end of his life there, preaching the gospel. No one got saved. No one came to Christ. He died. They sent in a very inexperienced young missionary in his place. This young missionary came in, started preaching the gospel. The whole village comes to Christ. This young missionary sits with the villagers and he says, I don't understand it. Why did you not respond to the gospel when my predecessor preached it? And they said, oh, it's simple. He kept telling us over and over and over that Jesus gives people the power to die with joy. And so we just stayed around long enough to see if it was actually true. And when he died and we stood at his deathbed, we knew immediately Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen, amen. Even when you suffer, God can bring about his redemptive purposes. And so be encouraged, church. That's not all. Look at verse 24. So God's leading, God's moving, God's showing them all these things. Now they... They get past Ammon, and here's 34. Rise up, set out on your journey, go over the valley of the Arnon. Look at this. Behold, I've given into your hand Sihon the Amorite. This is the first king. God's saying, okay, now you're going to engage. And not only that, God says, the, basically the victory is it's just as good as one. I'm giving him over to you. But now we'll look at the next phrase, very fascinating. We're gonna learn something about sovereignty here. God's saying, I'm going to do this no matter what. But you, he, he says, begin to take possession and contend with him. So God says, the battle's won, but here's the thing, you have to do something. You gotta go. You gotta exert some effort. And the reason this, I'm, I'm stopping here is because what that's telling me is there's no contradiction between God's sovereignty and human effort. Those two things actually go together. And I want to, I want to talk about this for a minute because a lot of people say, well, if God's absolutely sovereign, then it doesn't matter what I do. He's going to accomplish his purposes. But the reality is God is sovereign. And then God says, and I want you now to work Exert effort, go, move, do things. Yes, I'm sovereign, I'm on the move, I'm, I'm working in the world and I'm gonna use your effort, your hard work to bring these things about. Think about it. Think what God did to the people of Israel. He did miraculous things that only a sovereign God could do. He parted a Red Sea. He rescued them from the threat of Pharaoh's chariots. He went before them in a fire by night and cloud by day. He provided manna from heaven, water from rocks. This is sovereign God stuff. But there's one thing that God did not do for the people. He did not do the walking. They had to do the walking on their own. God didn't do the walking. God didn't do the following. He didn't do the eating or the drinking. He didn't do the obeying and the trusting. They had to work, and so do we. They had to move forward. They had to step out in faith. They had to break camp. They had to collect manna from the ground. God is sovereign, and human beings exert effort. So you realize there's abs so the sovereignty of God and our effort and volition actually go together quite well. They go together quite well. And then we keep reading. So verse, this is so interesting. This day I'll give, I'll give him into your hand. 
Um, he'll be in dread and fear of you, verse 25. And on the peoples who are under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and being anguished because of you, verse 26. So I, this is Moses, I sent messengers from the wilderness to Kedemoth to Sihon, this king, the king of Heshbon. And here was the message with words of peace. It's really interesting. God says, engage with him. I'm giving you his land. And Moses says, I'm gonna send him a peace offering. What is going on here? Saying, let me pass through your land. I'll only go by the road. I will turn aside, neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot. Now, when you're reading this, you're wondering, why is Moses doing this? Is this like last week where the people of Israel sent out spies in disobedience? Is Moses like just uh, delaying the inevitable? No. Here's the thing. This offering of peace is 100% genuine. Sihon is being given the chance to do the right thing. And the offering is totally valid. He could have done the right thing in that moment. But now look at the very next verse. Let me pass your land, okay, sell foot, as the sons of Esau who live in Seir and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me until I go over the Jordan into the land that the Lord was giving us. Look at this. But Sihon, the king of Heshbon, would not let us pass, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. What? Sovereign God, hardening a heart, but Sihon is rejecting a peace offering and you're reading it going, well, what is it? Is God hardening Sihon's heart or is Sihon doing what he actually wants to do? And the answer is, what's the answer? Yes, yes. How did God harden Sihon's heart? Think about this. He hardened his heart by offering him peace. Because nothing makes a king more angry than when people come towards your land and say, hey, I'll make a peace offering with you. <laughs> and I'll even buy water from you and food. And Sihon is going, nobody comes near my land and offers me a peace treaty. And his heart was hardened. My son-in-law is a really good ping pong player, okay? Like really good. I've actually never seen him lose. He's that good. And I am a really terrible ping pong player, okay? And I have played ping pong with Nat on multiple occasions and it never goes well for me, okay? But imagine if I stepped to the ping pong table and I said to my son-in-law, hey Nat, before we start this game, I'm gonna actually offer you in advance an opportunity for a tie on this one. Nat would say, close your mouth, McMurray, pick up your paddle. I'm about to humiliate you, <laughs> right? This is Sihon. Sihon is saying, you're offering me a piece. I'm going to take your money and I'm gonna take whatever food and water you have left. Did God harden Sihon's heart? Absolutely. Did Sihon do exactly what he wanted to do? Yes. Sihon's volition is left intact and God's sovereignty is not compromised. And somehow both of those truths meet. And it feels like a paradox. And in some ways it is. But folks, here's the thing. That's what the Bible teaches. God is sovereign and your choices matter. And somehow in the wisdom of God, those fit together. So he's good, he's sovereign, he's in control. What you're doing matters. And the reason I'm driving this is because I know for a fact some of you are in a place in your life where you're thinking, God's nowhere near the circumstances I'm going. How could he be? The stuff I'm dealing with, it seems so random. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. I was betrayed over here. God, where are you? Let me offer you a word of faith and encouragement. God is there. He loves you. He's pouring out his mercy, even if you can't see it right now. And he's gonna work through all of that to bring about his purposes. He's sovereign. And then one more, so lesson number three, 
God's justice is perfect. I'm just gonna read out this story here, but here's why I added the word perfect to the word justice. We're about to read a story that's gonna sound really, really gnarly to our modern sensibilities. And people in the room are gonna be asking the question, how in the world can this be just? But here's the thing at River West, we don't skip over stuff like this. If it's in the Bible, we're gonna talk about it. And I'm gonna talk about it right now. But the reason I wanna say God's justice is perfect, here's what I mean by that. What I mean is justice is not just something that God does. And justice is not something God created. Justice is something that God is in his fundamental character. He is just. And that means he can never do anything that is unjust. Even if in our very limited perspective, in our limited knowledge, we see something that looks like it's unjust and God is superintending it. It's never impugning God's justice. It's human wickedness in a fallen world. And we need to keep that in mind as we read what happens next. I left off at verse 32. Here's what happened. Then Sihon came out against us. He and all his people to battle at Jahaz. And the Lord our God gave him over to us. And we defeated him and his sons and all his people. And we captured all his cities at that time And devoted to destruction, every city, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Only the livestock we took as spoil for ourselves with the plunder of the cities that we captured. And that's really intense, isn't it? They wiped out everybody. And we read that and we go, what in the world? And you just said God's perfectly just. So I'm going to talk about this for just a minute. I'm not gonna explain this fully. A lot of you will leave and go, that felt inadequate. I can't do it here. That's why I'm having a forum on October 22nd at 6 p.m. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna teach on this for about an hour and a half. And the title of the forum is Violence in the Bible. I'm doing it then. I, it's not just that I can't cover it right now. The point of this story is not really to deal with the problems of people in the 21st century. This story is told for a different reason. But I am gonna tell you two things about why God asked the people of Israel to go in and wipe out Sihon and all of the people. There's two reasons, or there's two things you need to know. The first thing you need to realize is these passages here in Deuteronomy and then in Joshua retell some of this. They describe a specific occasion that was never repeated in biblical history. This was the only time in the history of Israel as they're going into the promised land that the people are told to take land from other people groups and wipe them out. It's never, it's never repeated. So there's no, there's no place in scripture where God tells us people to do that. And that means what this is, this is what we call descriptive, not prescriptive. This is not a prescription for the church later to justify the crusades, which were horrible. This was not a prescription later for Christians to justify colonialism, which was horrible. Any time in church history where Christians have used a text like this to justify violence or taking out other people groups, they were misinterpreting scripture and they were acting against the heart of Jesus. Amen? That's not what this is. It was a one-time moment. But this was regarded as an act of a, a judicial process. This was God saying, I'm gonna use Israel as my instrument to bring about justice on a people who are so wicked that if I don't, if I don't execute justice, I would actually be impugned. You may or may not know this, but as you read the Old Testament, the Canaanites and the Amorites and the people and Sihon and his people, we're talking about folks, we're talking about a wickedness that you and I would shudder if we we were actually there to see it go down. 
As a part of their religious practice, they sacrificed their own children. And they used temple prostitution, forced rape as a part of their worship. And God warned them again and again and again. He even said to Abraham, this is going to get worse and worse and worse until I do something about it. And finally, in an act of justice, God, in his sovereignty, he's sovereign. He knows things we don't know. He allows his people to go in and take out Sihon. And then, and I won't read the whole thing, but look at your Bible now. He takes out Og as well. That's chapter three. You can read it later. It's basically a repeat, verses one through 11. They, 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 they take all of Sihon's land and then they take Og's land and they bring about God's justice. What I want to do is I want to show you the last verse of that passage. Look at verse 11. There's something really interesting going on here. And I'm going to end here and I'm going to talk about Jesus for a minute. Look at this sentence. For only Og, the king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Do you remember that word? The wicked giants that went all the way back to the Nephilim. He's saying Og was, and his brother Sihon, they were brothers, were the last two of the wicked, demigod, spiritual giant kings. And God wiped them out. He was the last. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. It is not in Rabbah of the Ammonites. It was nine cubits in length. Why are we getting the measurements of Og's Ikea mattress? What's happening here? Why is he telling us this? Look at this statement. He goes, let me tell you something about the man's bed. It was nine cubits in length and four cubits in breadth, according to the common cubit, which we all know, right? The common cubit, right? Here's what he's saying. That bed was 14 feet long and six feet wide, probably because Og was 13 feet tall. He was a giant and he was wicked. And God says, I use my people Israel to come in towards the promised land, think about this, from the east to wipe out two wicked demigod kings before they entered the promised land. What's going on there? There's two things. Why is this happening east of the promised land? Why is this happening east of Eden? Why are the people outside of Eden? Why are there wicked kings there. This is fascinating. Did you know, you you may not have known, Sihon, the first king, in Hebrew, the letters of his name are the Hebrew word snake backwards. And his land, Heshbon, that's the Hebrew word for conspire or scheming. So this is the snake king of the land of scheming. And Og of Bashan, that word Bashan is the Aramaic word for snake. So we have two snake demigod kings blocking people from entering from east of Eden back into the garden. What is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Now you understand the ministry of Jesus. Remember I told you week one, you need Deuteronomy to understand why, what Jesus did. What happened to Jesus? Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit out of the promised land over the Jordan River into the wilderness east of Eden where what happened? He was resisted by a serpent king who tempted him. And what did Jesus do? Jesus took out the sword of the word of the living God and he defeated Satan in the wilderness. And then he went back into the promised land where he died on a cross And he rose again on the third day to completely eradicate spiritual evil. Why? Because we serve a God of perfect justice. River West. If you don't have a God of justice, giants and wicked people run the world. 
But when you have a God of justice, there will be a judgment day. And Jesus started that process through his death and his resurrection. And now you understand why you need a God, sovereign, yes, just, yes, and merciful. And what I'm gonna show you in just a minute is all those things, mercy, justice, sovereignty, they meet at the cross of Christ. That's what makes the cross so powerful. That's why we go to the table every Sunday to eat and drink which we're about to do right now. Will you bow your heads? I'm going to pray for you. Lord, it's a long passage. There's so much going on. Oh, Father, how I pray. Take all of that. Press it into human hearts in this room right now. I know, Lord, there are people sitting here today. They're suffering. They're hurting. They've been stabbed in the back by someone they love. They're in a season of wilderness. They're right now in sin, turning their back on you, Lord. Father, please, would you, would you meet folks in this moment? Pour out your grace. Remind us of who you are. As a church, we have an impossible task ahead. We cannot accomplish what you have for us unless we follow you. But also in this room, there are people who have an impossible task in front of them. God, give them a vision of your character this morning, I pray meet him in this place as we worship and as we go to the table. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the book of Deuteronomy. And we pray now that as we worship, you administer our hearts. Thank you, Lord God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to uh, hold between your fingertips the bread and the cup. And while you're thinking about that, can I remind you of the three traits of God? Scandalous mercy. And perfect justice. And sovereignty. And where do they converge most powerfully? They converge at the cross where Jesus, the son of the living God, took the penalty of human sin and the greatest act of mercy. And in the same moment, he executed perfect justice on wickedness. All because he's the sovereign living God. And so, folks, this is more than just a meal. It's a reminder of what makes the gospel so life-changing. And so, Lord God, as we eat, would you nourish us? As we drink, would you forgive us? May we leave white as snow. And may we leave on mission. Give us what we need today, God, to represent you in this world as we eat this bread and drink this cup. And we pray it together in Jesus' name, amen.